Maybe just mute your mic for a little for two seconds. Sorry. Okay, um, Ashanti, you can unmute yourself. I think we're ready to go. Yay. Fantastic. Okay, um, welcome everyone to a, another insert of the Here and Now digital series presented by Terex Stadenbosch. Um, my name is Denisha Davids and I am the speaker curator and licensee um, Terex Stadenbosch um, along with an amazing group of um, team members and volunteers. Um, and today we're joined by Ashanti Kuneni, who is the founder of Learning to Unlearn and also a learning designer at to you. If you want to read the rest of her stunning bio, please do that on our page. Um, and you can also connect with her um, on social media as well as through her website, which she'll give a link to us later. Um, but without further ado, really just to kick us off by saying that today we'll be discussing um, unlearning racism. And Ashanti is going to take us through a, a talk. Um, about that and then after that we'll be engaging I'll ask a few questions and then also hopefully there are some questions from the um, audience on on Facebook so please comment throughout the conversation we'll definitely get to your questions um, but without further ado Ashanti I'm handing straight over to you to kick us off oh thank you so much Lisa I'm so excited to be here this is my second TED talk guys how excited am I and I'm talking about something I'm really passionate about, which is essentially the human condition, right? How we human and how we engage with each other as humans who sometimes struggle to recognize the humanity in others, right? So part of finding better ways for us to human is unlearning racism, which is the topic of my talk today, as Felicia said, because race along with class and gender remain the major structures of privilege and oppression in the world. And we have built our world on the basis of these axes. And many of us fail to understand how the intersections of race, class, and gender construct all our lived realities, right? But for the purpose of this talk, I'm focusing specifically on racism because my journey as an activist really began in 2015 with the emergence of Fees Must Fall and what I call a baptism of fire into Black consciousness. Because for the first time in my life, I had to engage with the idea of Blackness and victimhood and as being inferior to whiteness, right, where I had to engage with white people who wanted me to shut up and sit down <laughs> as a black person who didn't know their place because I'm talking too loudly about things that are too uncomfortable. I mean, we were asking questions that can't be answered without questioning the very nature of freedom and what it means to be a born free in Rainbow Nation, South Africa. Uh, specifically for the Stellenbosch context, we were asking questions like, why is it that in 2016, black students must be protesting against the use of Afrikaans as an academic medium of instruction some 40 years after Black students were shot in the back and killed for protesting the same things in 1976. So in trying to find the answers for myself and in trying to understand my place in the world and also in being a student of international relations, which is effectively the study of states and how they relate to one another, the further I read, the more I began to realize that racial inequality, structural inequality, white supremacy is by design. It was carefully thought out and implemented and embedded into the very structures of our society, into the very mechanics of the global economy. This is why in South Africa, we talk about the architecture of, 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 of apartheid, right? So this is not a mistake. Racism does not happen by chance. And in realizing this, I had to ask myself how I was going to contribute to the fight for racial justice and equality. And what's applicable here is the saying that do what you can, where you are with what you have. What I have is a voice that people like to listen to apparently. So I realized that I needed to use that voice responsibly. And how I do that is by engaging people in difficult conversations about things that make them uncomfortable like racism. 
And one of the aspects of my activism is in bearing witness to society in the Baldwinian sense. So a lot of what I will be sharing with you this evening are my own thoughts about racism and hopefully some helpful tips that can help you on your own unlearning journey. So the first thing I want to speak to is the levels of racial literacy in society. We don't properly understand the construct of race. And before you can unlearn anything, you need to first understand what it is, understand how race is constructed, and be able to identify, identify the myriad of ways in which this manifests in our lives, in society, and in the world. We need to be able to articulate the kinds of lived realities racism creates through our individual, individual socializations as people. None of us are untouched by racism. We are all affected by this construct called race, but very few of us actually understand it for what it is because, because it is such a behemoth of a problem. It's overwhelming, it's all encompassing. And until recently, it was much easier to just pretend that this thing didn't exist than to actually engage with it. But now that we have seen COVID-19, this pandemic, man, everyone's gone down into lockdown. And then you've seen the global rise of the hashtag Black Lives Matter protests that took place after the unnecessary murder of George Floyd. We are now in a context where we can no longer pretend that this thing doesn't exist, right? Now we have to engage about racism because effectively what mother nature has done, she said, all of you are grounded, go to your rooms, sit in front of the mirror and think about what you've done, reflect on your behavior, look at yourself. That's what mother nature has done to us now. And because we have been so divorced from what it means to be human for such a long time. This timeout has really highlighted all of our ugly. And in seeing this ugly up close and personal, it has created a sense of urgency around these issues. You have white people very, very, very anxious about not appearing racist and uninformed about racial issues right now. You have companies that have suddenly found the impetus to finally talk about diversity and equity and inclusion and implement these DEI, DEI policies and programs, right? So there seems to be a sense of suddenness about the racial issues that have arisen during this time. And what I find interesting about that is that it clearly shows a low level of racial literacy in our society and a general lack of knowledge about history. Because if you are only waking up to these issues now in 2020, where have you been? What kind of life have you been living that you're only waking up to this problem now? What kind of company have you been running that you're only now deciding to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion policies? Black people have been killed, murdered, without consequence for centuries. This is not a new issue. Racism is one of our oldest injustice. So the, the sense of suddenness is interesting to me. And I think to answer the, the question of why people are only waking up now in 2020, speaks directly to the shape-shifting nature of white supremacy. White supremacy is a funny thing for it is not what it seems. It's an illusion. It is, it is a figment of the imagination. It appears as one thing when in actual fact it's another, right? It's a comedian that can shape-shift and take on any form. So understanding how white supremacy shape-shifts throughout history, how it moves and pos posi positions itself as non-threatening and non-violent depending on the societal context is important because it will, it will allow you to recognize things for what they are. And in speaking about recognizing things for what they are, another aspect of racism that complicates and muddies the water um, and the muddies the understanding is the language of racism, how we talk about racism if we talk about it at all, right? Because generally we avoid uh, these things because they make us uncomfortable. They bring up a whole bunch of emotions that we don't uh, know how to fully rationalize and mostly because we just don't know how to talk about racism and even when you do possess the vocabulary to talk about race that very vocabulary is constructed in such a way that we can never overcome racism because the language is inadequate so let's just take the term white supremacy for an example and also to illustrate the importance of being able to recognize things for what they actually are white supremacy in a nutshell is the idea that white people are supreme and superior in all things, and therefore are justified in dominating and conquering others, right? This idea of white supremacy justified slavery, colonialism, and apartheid. But when you look closely, when you deep down, and you look at this idea and how it manifests in society, you begin to realize that there's nothing supreme about whiteness. There's nothing superior about it. In fact, what the term white supremacy does is hide the violent mediocrity of whiteness. 
white supremacy is essentially the perfection of mediocrity. And I say this because as a black woman, I have to be the furthest thing from mediocre if I'm going to stand a chance in the society. We, and we all know that as, as a black person, you need to work twice as hard to get half as much. Where you find yourself as a black person working for a manager uh, that is, you, you find yourself more qualified than your manager in a company. But because John, who's your manager, plays golf with the CEO on the weekends, his incompetence as a manager suddenly becomes irrelevant. And we don't talk about these things because implicit in the language of racism is that black people are the only ones that can be incompetent. In the same way, it is only black governments that can be corrupt, right? So I understand white supremacy as a violent mediocrity because when we talk about whiteness as supreme and utilize the ling linguistic dichotomy between black and white superior and inferior, we cannot properly solve this issue. We're trying to solve a problem we do not fully comprehend, which in and of itself is a barrier to racial justice, but we are fighting about it, even though we don't properly understand. You know? So I think we, begin, we need to begin to think more deeply about the kinds of language that we use when we talk about ourselves, right? And so to double down and to continue with the concept of white supremacy, the idea of whiteness or white people as superior requires the existence of the idea of blackness and black people as inferior. These are two sides of the same coin. One cannot exist without the other. So for as long as we hold on to conceptions of ourselves as being black meaning inferior or white meaning superior, racism will always be an issue. So I challenge us all to think deeply about how we speak about who we are outside of the boxes of identity that history has given us. But because we cannot talk about racism without referring to ourselves as black people or white people or whatever, especially in the South African context, the conversations that we had a hundred years ago, we are still having and we are continuing to have, which is unfortunate, right? So part of the work of unlearning racism is for us to, is, is for us to individually find ways to transcend our personal identification with the constructs of race and our belief in the illusions of inferiority and superiority when it comes to other humans. I challenge everyone listening to think about this. If who you are begins with the color of your skin, we are never going to solve this problem. I am a black woman, yes, because that's what society says I am, but being black has got nothing to do with who I am, right? In the same way, when you see a plane in the sky, there's a pilot inside the plane. And um, to assume that the plane is a pilot would be illogical. So in the same way, our bodies are simply machines that we've been given in order to live out our life's purposes on this plane. So part of the work of unlearning racism is not only finding a sense of self that does not rely on the exterior color of the machine that you've been given, but finding out why you have been given this machine in the first place. Why are you here? What is your life's purpose? Me, personally, my purpose speaks to the need to help us learn how to human better. And how I do that is by engaging people in the kinds of difficult, open, honest, courageous conversations that people would, rot, would rather not have, right? So having the desire and the ability to find the answers to, this, to these questions will, I think, in my opinion, allow us to transcend a lot of the issues that we have in society. And um, in closing, I want to just share a few tips with you uh, to help you think more deeply about this issue of racism. So if you find yourself waking up to the issues of race and racism, right? I challenge you to write a personal racial history. When was the first time you encountered the issue of race? How was race talked about in your home? How does family, how does your family speak about people of other racial groups? What kind of teachers did you have? Did they look like you? Did they not look like you? Why is that? Account for yourself, write it out. Like physically, actually just write it out, right? And see what you learn about yourself in the process and what kind of discoveries you make in writing this personal racial history. Grab a friend, get him, her, or they to do the same thing, get together and share stories, right? The second tip I wanna share is for us to be more cognizant um, um, and intentional with the language that we use when we're talking about race. In South Africa, we largely only speak about black and white people when we're talking about racism and colored people don't hear themselves reflected in those conversations. Colored or Indian people, if they don't identify as big or black, right? So and, and an example of what happens when you don't use nuanced language to talk about race, um, you can YouTube the big debate on racism and just see how that conversation 
uh, went um, because we, we weren't thinking and being intentional about how we're speaking about race and speaking to the nuanced lived experiences of people in this country. And then the third thing I want to share is the, sen the feelings of uncomfortableness around racism. If you're uncomfortable, then that's good. It means that you're open. It means that you're being challenged and you're possibly willing to engage. You know, we all make mistakes. We don't all have the correct answers. So don't close yourself off from having difficult conversation because you are scared of saying the wrong thing or that you will appear uninformed, right? And as a last uh, tip to speak to the point of being uninformed, a personal value of mine is that everybody is entitled to their opinions. Everyone, you can have an opinion about anything but I personally only engaged with informed opinions. <laughs> so if you wanna engage a black person about race, please make sure that you've asked Google the question before you come ask a black person the question. Um, like, like, do, like unlearning racism is a, is, is, is a lifelong process. It's not a once off event, just like race, right? So to make sure that you're continually educating yourself and reading as far and as widely as possible because readership is leadership in my opinion. And in a nutshell, those are my thoughts, Delisha. <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too quickly. <laughs> um, thank you, Ashanti. Um, no, I think I think that was excellent. I unfortunately lost some of that because of my connection. Um, but no if, if that was, uh, let me just check the comments on Facebook. Um, Lisa Marie DeBell saying, always fantastic hearing Ashanti speak. Um, and, and I think that really was just a test to, to the legacy of leadership that you've, you've led on campus, particularly in terms of the kinds of conversations um, that you're, you're continuing to have. And I think also that you, you know, you've made it your career and you've made it your purpose, as you've said, to, to help others um, deal with their own issues first and then, you know, try and um, make sure that that also becomes part of their own journey in helping the systemic racism fall, essentially. 100%. 100%. Um, Ashanti, um, there aren't any comments at the moment, but I think, you know, maybe as more people join, um, they'll have some questions. But I think I, I jotted down a few notes and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on them. So I think very early in the talk, um, you know, you sort of really beautifully defined, um, you know, what white supremacy is. And, and I think something I personally struggle with um, to, and I think also, you know, thinking about why does systemic racism still exist, even though people who were previously oppressed are in the majority. Um, mm. So why is it that, that an increase in numbers, an increase in people getting sort of senior positions, an increase in um, really just having diversity in the workplace, why hasn't that been enough? So that's sort of one part of the question. Mm. And, and I almost wanna ask, I, I, my question really is sort of why does the why does the prestige of whiteness continue when there is really a majority of of black and Indian and and I don't know if you want to call it ethnic people or um you know why does the prestige of whiteness exist within a lot of the spaces that we find ourselves in? Yeah, I think part of the part of the answer to that is you know referring to the part of my talk where it says like understanding who you are our belief in the superiority of whiteness right because self interest is a powerful motivator and the closer you are to to whiteness the closer your proximity to whiteness the faster you climb the social the the, the upward mobility ladder right and um i think the the reason why you still have the kinds of uh, uh, cultures and racial problems that you have, even though there's been an increase, is because of the whole aspect of internalized racism. We have internalized the thing that white people are better and superior, and so therefore we we we, we pass that on to our children, our colleagues, our friends through the ways in which we talk and our implicit behaviors. Right. So this is why at the end I said our ability to transcend the constructs of race and our identification with the exterior color of the body we've been given. And what that, what that means for your own sense of self is important, right? Because if you begin with, I am a victim as a black person or with white people, I suppose it's not so explicit, but like there's this assumption that of course I'm superior, of course I'm going to get everything, the sense of entitlement to everything and people's um, time and energy, right? We need to unlearn that. And that's the beginning, that's the beginning part of that is that even you can have Black people in managerial positions, but if the black person thinks that the white man is still the boss and is superior, 
his lived praxis, his modality of life is going to reflect that. And so I, th I think for me, the importance is beginning with self. Like, who are you? Do you believe in this thing of superiority and inferiority? And if you do, why is that? Who told you that you were inferior? Who told you that you were superior? Like, where did we get that thing? And how do you find ways to purge that from yourself? You know, because as I said, like the color of your skin has got nothing to do with who you are. Like, this is just a machine we've been given for us to live out our life's purpose on this plane. And not and, and and unlearning that and not identifying with those constructs is a very difficult task uh, uh, to do. Yes, um, and I think I think that's sort of my question. Then you know, a follow up question is, if I'm interested or if I if I have this inkling that I've internalized racism, and that I um, you know my proximity to rate to to whiteness. Um, is sort of more favorable. Let's let's call it that. How do yeah. I begin that journey? How do I how do I begin that kind of self-reflective journey of of deciding and and situating myself in those kinds of um, you know systemic or previously oppressive systems? Mm -hmm. So even for me, I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm a colored woman, but I'm sort of you know light skin colored woman, and and I acknowledge that that has perhaps in some way, um, you know, ensured that I had certain opportunities and so forth. And, and that's also only a realization that I think I've had, you know, recently, two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, so, but that is because, you know, I, I've surrounded myself with people, you know, like you, for instance, and, and also educated myself in that sense. But, but what about that person that's sort of really only now realizing listen, whoa, something's not right here, something I need to fix with myself. What does, what mm, you know, mm. a few practical tips look like in that, in that sense? Yeah, I mean, that speaks to the first tip I shared is that just write out, like sit down, get a pen and paper, like actually write it out, your, your personal racial history. Like think about your life and think about how race has influenced or not influenced your life, you know? So like if you get to the, 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 the end of writing out your own personal history, and it is only in 2020 when racism started to be an issue for you, then, you know, things about privilege and the, the bubble of ignorance you need to begin to engage with, right? And how that has possibly impacted colleagues that you've had or your interpersonal relationships across race. What does your friendship circle look like? Is it diverse? Do you, like this thing of, I have black friends, I have a black boyfriend, you know, like it, it, you need to be able to really just account for yourself in your own life and your own experiences, right? Think about, and, 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 if, and if you're only beginning now the journey, I think that is the best place to start because you can't speak to something you have no experience of, right? So besides just accounting for yourself, breathe. There's so much that has been written. This is such an old problem, which speaks to the first point that I said about the sudden newness of racial righteous anger like this is not a new problem this is an age-old problem and so many people have written so many things to help us solve this thing but you're just not engaging right so this is why also don't ask a black person if you haven't googled <laughs> if google you need to google first before you come and call me you know like my since george floyd my phone has been going off the hook with people in my white people in my network Ashanti, what must we do what can we do how how can we solve this thing and i'm just like but guys, did you Google? <laughs> did you ask Google the question before you picked up the phone to call me and take my emotional and mental time? Because this stuff is taxing, right? It's not my job to educate you. Yes, I'm possibly better suited to educate you because I'm gentler when I speak to white people, you know, than others. I have a friend who just does, who she, don't have, she doesn't have the time. She does not have the time. She will straight up tell you, go Google, leave me the hell alone. I don't have the emotional or the mental capacity to be engaging with you, right? Because it isn't our responsibility. And we have all the information at our fingertips. Just read, guys. Because the more you read and engage and talk to other people, talk to your people who look like you about the thing, you know, because Black people and people of color, we talk about race all the time because this is our lived reality. It's the thing that affects us all the time. So writing a personal racial history is not necessarily applicable to a black person who knows what the hell racism is, right? But it is for white people who are well-meaning and well-intentioned and who, you know, are feeling really frustrated and anxious and who think that 
possibly racist are only bad people, but I'm a good person. So I can't possibly be a racist because I'm not bad. I'm not a bad person, you know? Um, and unfortunately, this thing has got nothing to do with goodness or badness. It's got nothing to do with that. You just need to, as I said, just, you know, account for yourself, read, try and engage and be open to actively listening to hear, not listening to answer points. Because, you know, listening to answer is a thing that people like to do when we're not, when we're talking past each other. So listen to hear when a Black person shares their experience of racism, you know, and don't minimize or invalidate the experience. Or on top of that, don't say, oh, I also had it tough. We didn't have money growing up. Like that's not, that's not the point. The point is to get you to think deeply and reflect about what your skin means in a society that has based everything upon a hierarchy of skin tone, right? Even when we talk about colorism, like there are nuances with, there are levels to these things. As you've just um, alluded about you being a light skinned colored woman who's had possibly more access just simply because of how you're presenting, right? So yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you, Shanti. I just want to read some comments that are coming through. Um, Kirsten Adams says, you know, she just encountered this for the first time um, and she was just expressing, you know, thanks for your work and that she'll continue to follow. And particularly on the, the your personal racial history, Anri Magerman said, you know, so many of us need to do this reflection. And I think, um, I think it's really just sometimes it is about not having the tools to, you know, sometimes we do within this sort of change, um, we, we identify that something needs to happen, but we don't always have the tools to to get started. And I, and I mm -hmm. think that's very helpful mm -hmm. um, to yeah. just, you know, sort of yeah, conscientize yourself about like where you are, what is your own, you know, situatedness within these systems and how have you experienced it yourself first before you try and go out um, and, and understand other people. Yeah, other people's experiences. Ashanti, I 100%. wanted to ask um, also, so you, you did mention, and I mean, you know, I, I'm not seeing any comments, so I'm going to take full full time and full, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm going to just make use of this opportunity to ask the questions that I think, you know, I'm interested in, and, and particularly the very interesting point you made about, I'm um, sorry, that's my husband walking. <laughs> Leave him, it's fine. <laughs> um, the the very important point on nuancing this conversation of race um and as you've so so you clearly mentioned you know when we leave a particular racial group out of the the conversation that that could also have dire effects so um in that sense you know what is what are your thoughts about people who say for instance that they don't see color number one that's sort of you know one of the things that i hear a lot um you know people that say they don't see color and they want to treat everyone equally so what are your ideas or thoughts around that um and also the idea that black people and indian people and colored people can't be racist um how, how do you how do you navigate conversations in, in those two two aspects <laughs> okay so the first one about don't see color, they're lying. You see color, unless you, even colorblind people see color. I mean, what do you mean? Like that doesn't, that does not make any logical sense to say, I don't see color. It, it, it doesn't make sense, right? Um, you do see color and treating everybody the same means that you're not uh, taking into consideration how you're landing with people and how you're impacting people and how people are possibly uh, receiving you and engaging with you, right? So to those that say they don't see color, please don't lie. You can see this black shirt, you know, you can see my brown skin, like you can, like color is something that you can see. Not to be ableist about it, but like even color blind people are able to distinguish between the different races in the group. So that is just an illogical statement to make. Then about the thing about black and Indian and color people can't be racist. I agree because racism, effectively requires prejudice and the structural power to be able to affect that prejudice and bias, right? So apartheid was a group of people who didn't like a bunch of other people and created structures and laws and, and a society that implemented that bias, right? As people of color, we've never had that kind of institutional power to implement. We can be prejudiced, definitely. We can be biased, definitely. But to be racist, requires institutional and structural power to implement that bias. And that is 
that is also part of the thing of understanding what racism is. This is why we say only white people can be racist because white people historically have, have been the only group in the human family who've had the structural and institutional power to affect those, those, those prejudices, right? So that, those are my response to that two things. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very interesting because, uh, you know, I, I, and maybe I don't know enough yet, but I, I don't think, you know, that's where the two of us might disagree because um, just in the sense of taking you, you know, back earlier to the, the question of, I, I think prestige and, and, and also power might have changed with this in the, in the respect that, you know, as a, and, and still not to the large extent that we experienced with white people, yes, but I do think that when you're discriminating against someone based on their race or their gender, that that is also not, you know, right. I don't know if, if you call it racism, if you don't, um, you know, that's maybe, you know, some kind of learning that I still need to do. But um, I think there would be people, you know, that that disagree on that. And so I would really love to think what the TEDx Stellenbosch community thinks around that. Um, yeah, I and mean, I think, you know, I think we need an entire another conversation to unpack that even. 100%. No, I do agree. Look, discriminating against people simply because of things that they have no control over, like their skin color, like their gender, does not make sense. And it's part of us learning how to human better, how to be better humans with each other, learning to have empathy, you know, and consideration. So it's not a good thing. No, I don't agree that it's a good thing. But racism and white supremacy, right, requires institutional power. So as a black person, so to example, I, so for example, one of the things Indians, in my experience, don't like black people. I've had Indian people be very problematic towards me. I don't, I don't know what it is. Okay. But the point is that they didn't have, they didn't, uh, uh, that prejudice or that bias didn't affect which schools I could go to or where I could sleep or who I could marry or what I, where I could pee or what beach I could go to. White people are the ones that have historically had this power. So that's what we mean by racism. So we can, so yes, you can be prejudiced and that is bad. And obviously the whole thing about, we need to be able to be better humans and be more empathetic with each other and be kind of each because all of us bleed red. Oh, Ashanti, I think you've lost your sound there. You lost me. Oh, no, just sorry, it's my, my, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's just understanding that we are all humans. We are, we all require the same things to thrive and to be happy. Right. And um, not denying each other uh, those, those, those things, but racism in the context that I'm speaking about in, in the context of white supremacy requires the control of the levers of power within society. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I, I, I get that. And thank you for that clarification. Um, so, so I think, you know, I, um, as a, as a closing off question, what is, you know, we are in the here and now and systemic racism is unfortunately still thriving. Um, but we are of course seeing, you know, groups of people stand up, um, and allies as well. So not just those who have been previously oppressed, but white people and, and friends yes. and, and, and allies and so on. Um, yes. so if, if you have to imagine, you know, the future where there is this, common leaning into our humanity what does that look like um you know or so all of or maybe ask differently you know will we ever live in a world without any systemic racism so you know that's an interesting thing for me because i'm also a history student right and i have yet to find an example in the history of humanity where a society was properly equal like where we were all equal like i have yet to find an actual tangible example of equality like that right but i think part of the hierarchy of society what is what is new and um really uh, the english is failing me now really painful about this kind of inequality is that it denies those lower on the rung their humanity right that's the chat so everyone has different callings in life, everybody has different skills, everybody has different purposes to and functions uh, within society. But your function did not uh, solely depend on whether or not you possessed uh, humanity. And so for me, when I'm thinking about an equal society or a society of the future where we lean into each other's humanity, 
It is living in a world where everyone is able to self-actualize. Everybody has the, so if you are born with a gift for singing, you, how society is structured is su in, in such a way that you are able to go and go forth and conquer and fulfill your, 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 your talent and use your talent, right? We don't, so right now, the kind of, the way in which our society is structured is that it only allows those with resources and money to self-actualize themselves. If you don't have the resources and money, self-actualization is off the table because you can't be thinking about such things if you're hungry, yeah? <laughs> and like that you can't uh, eat a vote. So for me, a society where we are all leading into each other's humanity is, is one where you are able to self-actualize and achieve your highest, best self version of yourself, whatever that looks like. And without you being judged or challenged or broken down or whatever for it for wanting to be whatever it is that you want to be, right? So the ability and the freedom to dream as far as you wanna dream and to become whatever it is that you wanna become, that we live in a society that enables that from everybody, every one of us, regardless of race. That's my, my dream world, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. And I, I said that was the last question, but we do still have some time. So now I'm going to I'm going to go for another one, if you don't mind, Ashanti. No problem. Um, you know, seeing that it is, you know, still I was <laughs> seeing that it is still, you know, the celebration of, of Women's Month um, and that we're sort of closing, you know, um, that off from from a TEDx and Bosch perspective. Um, you know, maybe maybe you you want to share some experiences or some thoughts on on the intersection between mm. race and gender, mm. um, and particularly from your own perspective. I'm sorry. Mm. Sure. <laughs> so what's so interesting? So I'm in the middle of writing a book, right? Um, and I'm thinking about you know women and our history, and you know this whole things that. Uh, um, you, you strike a woman, you strike, you strike her off. And I was thinking about this, so this is speaking about black women and our, you know, the, the march to parliament that we had and the past laws that we, you know, we were protesting against at the time, but how this uh, image or ideal of the black woman as a rock uh, has, is still relevant in our society today. And I, in reflecting about it, I was just like, actually, no, guys, we are not rocks. We are people that die if you hit us, right? Look, the levels of femicide in this country are incredible. So uh, part of the intersections of race and gender, I think, is also as Black women, speaking as a Black woman, this thing of having to be a strong Black woman who can take anything and everything, right? We need to stop that because this is part of the reason why we have mental health issues, like all of those things, like we are not okay because we are taking the burden of society. We are society's punching bag. And we accept that role because I'm a rock, I'm a strong woman. And that we need to stop that acceptance, you know? So for me, what, I, what that insight or what that has meant for me is that like I choose, I choose when I want to be strong. <laughs> and other times when I just don't have the capacity, I just don't. And oftentimes rejecting that role as a strong black woman is met with such shock at the audacity of you. Like, how dare you not want to be this thing that society has said you must be all the time, you know? And it's just, it's, un it's unhealthy, it's unhealthy. And I think we need to be softer with ourselves and allow ourselves to rediscover who, are, who we are um, in a more, in a, in a lighter manner. Right. Let other people let, let other people be society's punching bag for a while. Me, I'm not. I'm not. I don't play that game anymore. <laughs> I love that. I think it's such a refreshing thought as well. And, and also how you came to that insight, I think it's, it's, it's exceptional. So I'm very excited to when this book comes out to see what that is. And we'll probably yeah. invite you for a third conversation then. Oh, that would be great. Um, so, we can, <laughs> so we can unpack that. Um, Ashanti, is there anything? I'm just going to check the, the Facebook comments one more time. Um, yeah, no, not seeing any, anything at the moment. But, you know, um, Joy was asking, are we recording this? So definitely interesting interest um you know in in watching this again um yeah, but yeah. is there anything that you want to sort of add as 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 a parting sort of word before we close off yeah i think just we must all just be kind with ourselves you know like this is not this is not a easy problem to solve we just all need to be kind with ourselves kinder with each other have empathy really do the deep personal reflection because i think 
if you don't use this time of the lockdown and the you know pandemic or whatever to do the reflection it's a missed opportunity um mm -hmm. we, the world is ending guys we are living in the end of days climate change is an actual thing um and so we need to get to a point where we are focusing on you know healing ourselves as people and as humans and finding a better way to human with each other and if I, and i think if we can begin to do that and to begin to engage with each other in a little bit in a little uh in a more softer way a more caring way a more empathetic way and be more considerate of each other um we'll we'll get there yeah mm. <laughs> i love that i i absolutely love that and i think um you know particularly the the images of in the media is often of violence, which is obviously it's not to to be hidden away. But um, you know, when are those images going to be softer? Where we, um, I mean, I remember, you know, I, I almost want to say the iconic picture of the end of Fees Must Fall, and I think it was Joel Manuel with. Um, I can't remember what her name was, but um, how they were just sort of hugging each other in, yes, you know, in celebration. I I, yeah, and and to me, you know, what you're explaining, what you're describing, sort of, it, it's those kinds of moments with one another in in every step of the journey. Um, yeah. And I and I hope that I, you know, I hope that we get to to make that happen, but also to see it, um, you know, yeah. in, its, in its full fruition. So no, Shanti, thank you so much. I think you've given us a lot of things to think about. Um, I think there's still a lot of things up for debate. Um, I also just want to say that, you know, the speakers that we invite onto this platform um, is there to, to probe and to provoke, and it's not there to polarize. So I hope that those of you who are watching who have watched with us, um, you know, continue to engage on a personal level, but also with your friends, as as it's Shanti has mentioned, to the people around you, the people in your workplace, your family, and really dig deep and, and try and situate who you are um, in relation to race, in relation to systems of oppression. Um, and then from there on, you know, move forward and keep on educating, keep on learning and unlearning. 100%. As, <laughs> as Ashanti would know a lot about. So, um, you know, with that, I just want to thank everyone for watching. Um, and I really want to thank you again, Ashanti, for taking the time out um, to, to chat with us in this way. Um, you know, it's not the same as physically gathering. I keep on saying that, but it is a close second. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thanks so much. And if the only thing we achieved is really just to bring ideas together within this community, and then that's, I think, what, what you've achieved yet tonight. So thank you so much. Thank I just want to end off by saying to anyone watching, um, we're always on the lookout for new ideas worth spreading um, in the Tariq Stanmash community. So if you know of anyone, um, if you know of someone doing amazing work in any field, um, give us a shout. Um, you can always message us on Facebook, but you'll also find my contact details there. Um, and then also Shanti mentioned, you know, that the world is ending and uh, climate change is real. So in that, um, you know, this is not yet the official launch, but in October, Tariq Stanmash will be focusing on what we call our countdown event, which is all about sustainability um, and the environment. So look out for that um, on our page, looking for, you know, again, projects to um, to showcase and, and seeing what's happening in our community. So yes, thank you very much for spending your, your Thursday evening with us. Um, we'll be back here next week with um, an exciting speaker as always. Um, once again, Ashanti, thank you so much. And thank I look you. forward to engaging with everyone and we'll send you questions, you know, if people are sending us no questions problem. afterwards. That's fine. <laughs> I'm, looking for, I'm looking forward to your sustainability series. That's going to be really interesting. I think it's yes, very relevant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so much, so everyone. Much. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. Ciao.